you very much, everybody. Um, and thank you to the previous speakers. It's been an absolutely amazing day. Um, I was wondering how I was going to survive it, but it was, it was very, very easy. So thank you, everybody. Um, and thank you, uh, Anne, for inviting me here. I initially kind of was very reluctant and put up a, as, as good a fight as I, I thought I could because she was saying 17 minutes, and I was saying, you've got to be kidding. Um, and of course, TED isn't really about presenting complicated research findings and boring to people to death with reams of data on PowerPoint presentations. It's more about you know, that little moment uh, that you can take away and chew the cud on after you've all gone home over a pot of tea and a pack of digestive biscuits. So I'm slightly prone to waffling and getting sidetracked, so I'm going to leave you with my little gem right at the start. And it's essentially this, that we can all make a difference. Uh, we needn't be miserable in the process. You know, it's just a question of offering, uh, empowering people and giving people the wherewithal. It, it's, it's not all bad news. And I say this as a, a conservationist, that it doesn't really matter what area you live in, be it, you know, uh, political, uh, social, cultural, sporting. Uh, you can be a, a solo player, you can be a team player, but we can all affect change. That's not to say we, we forget about the big issues, the burning issues that Jean men mentioned a few of them there. You know, we do have, um, we, we are losing uh, species. We have habitat destruction, climate change. All these issues are big burning issues, but we just don't need to harp on about them ad nauseum because people kind of switch off message very, very, very quickly. Uh, and uh, this is a problem, I think, sometimes when we hear environmentalists speak, it's always negative. And to a degree, that's because, of course, negative news tends to attract publicity and column inches far easier than positive news stories. So I'm going to tell you um, a, a real good news story. And I'm sure for many of you who, who live in West Cork, this is probably uh, no, no big news that, um, that we live in an amazing place to see whales and dolphins. And I will dip into that uh, a little bit later. But I've been on a very, very interesting journey, I guess. Uh, it started being born in Athlone, County Westmead, so I could hardly have been uh, brought up in a more landlocked area and further away from, from the sea. Uh, my father worked in the civil service, so thankfully we had to make, make a move. Um, so we moved, kind of unfortunately, to the east coast, a place called Greystones County Wicklow, where I spent most of my early years. And he could have been moved to the south coast, which would have been really handy for me in latter years. Uh, but he moved, uh, we moved to the east coast, and I spent um, a very happy childhood in Greystones County Wicklow. Uh, this is the, uh, the, 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 the pier here, where I think my journey actually began. I was in my, probably that dodgy age of 13, you know, 13-year-old teenage male. Um, and... I was fishing off the back of the, the pier wall in Greystones, uh, along with about 20 or 30 other, you know, mostly Jackines come down from Dublin to fish in Greystones because they actually think Greystones is County Dublin, but it's County Wicklow, uh, a sore point. But it was full of, full of people fishing and it was a nice day, but there was a certain sense in that day that something unusual was going to happen. It was like we could feel the atmospheric pressure dropping. It was quite scary. I had the same sense a couple of years ago when we photographed a tornado up in Ross Moor, not terribly far from here, but you could just feel the atmosphere change. It was quite gripping. Very quickly, the skies got very leaden. There's a lovely Irish expression, merv, which means that the atmosphere is getting, it's sticky, it's clammy. But this was in quite an extreme way. So people started packing their bags in, in anticipation that the mother load was going to drop from the skies. And I looked down the pier wall down along here, and uh, there's just myself and old boy Tom. Tom was a chap from Liverpool who used to come over every summer. And I remember Tom from the previous year. So Tom looked at me and I looked at Tom and we said, yeah, we, 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 we'll hang on because there was a sense that something unusual was going to happen. So we were fishing away and we caught more fish in that half hour than we probably did for the, re you know, the, the remainder of the summer. And we couldn't quite figure out what was happening. We were bringing in fish, um, you know, multiple species on one fishing line. And we go, Jesus, Tom, what are they? And Tom says, I have no clue what they were. They weren't the usual species like cod, mackerel, pollock that you'd expect to catch. They were just exotic. And uh, we were catching you know, two species. We were just bringing them in. It was absolutely amazing. And it became very clear to me after a while what was happening. As I looked off towards the, the, the Brayside, still in County Wicklow, 
the, the bray side here, and I could see three dorsal fins just breaking the surface tension of the water. And of course, this wasn't long after jaws had broken loose, and, uh, and I was thinking, crikey, great white, no, it couldn't be great white sharks, could they? But they were clearly bottlenose dolphins now in hindsight, and the bottlenose dolphins were hunting. They were chasing the fish, so that the fish had pretty much nowhere to go. They were, they were left up against the bottom of the pier wall, and they, they were helping us. And, I guess in, in African cultures, there's lots of examples of, of bottlenose dolphins feeding with, with local fishing or hunting and helping local fishing communities. You know, they'd herd the fish up to the beach and the fishermen would, would throw out the nets, they'd catch the fish, they'd bring them in and they'd always leave a few fish uh, outside the nets for the dolphins to take. And you would think I would have reciprocated in some similar fashion. I didn't. My, my reaction to this and you've got to get inside the head of a 13-year-old male. My reaction to this was to delve deep into my tackle bag and take out what I called a killer sp spinner. And this, this was the ultimate killing device. And this was going to go, this was going to take anything, even the most intelligent of marine mammals. And I, I had a cunning plan. And my cunning plan was to catch and po probably kill this one of these three bottlenose dolphins. I wasn't particularly fussy which one. Um, <laughs> and the dolphins were probably about two or three hundred meters out. And I casted probably about 15, 20 metres out, pitifully short, and brought in the, the, the line, and of course I, I drew a blank on the, on, the, on the dolphin hunt anyway that day. But I've often thought about that day. My first sighting of dolphins, my God, my, my reaction as a young male was to try and cap capture one of them. Brendan Price, many years ago, of the Irish Seal Sanctuary, uh, we were I was telling him this over one very drunken night, uh, in, in, in Wicklow, and he was saying, well, it's so typical of you, he said, you're, you're essentially a hunter. You essentially, even what you're doing today, spending years up on the cliffs, out in boats, following whales around, the drive for you is essentially the drive of, uh, of, of the chase. Um, and I, I have reflected on that many times since, and I do think there's a, probably something, something to that. But I, I had a pretty unspectacular career in the commercial environment, and I decided I was going to pack it all in, and I, I needed to learn more about whales. I was so passionate about whales, and I, I, I couldn't quite do it off Greystones and County Wicklow. There wasn't a whole, whole heap happening up there. So I traveled around the world and have had the privilege of seeing whales in the most amazing landscapes. And it's a really good thing about whales uh, that they tend to frequent places that are beautiful, and you know, West, West Cork is certainly no exception to that rule. Uh, places like British Columbia, uh, Vancouver Island with killer whales, blue whales in Baja, California, Mexico, where I return to every, every couple of years, amazing. Uh, Patagonia, where I've been down to observe southern right whales, down where Richard Payne or Roger Payne did his PhD many, many years ago on southern right whales. A fantastic place, Patagonia, must go if you haven't been. Crossing the Atlantic to the Cape Verde Islands, where the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group have had a number of uh, research expeditions, and even uh, more recently a filming expedition, which some of you might have seen on the recent Wild Journeys documentary. Of course, we're trying to track the movements of Irish, and in particular, in fairness, West Cork uh, humpback whales as they move on their migration uh, down along the, uh, this African archipelago of the Cape Verde Islands, and then other fantastic locations like uh, th this one place in particular, supposedly the whale watching capital of the world. Hermans, I, I am actually looking to change that. But uh, it's one of these amazing places where you can sit in a cliff and watch whales within a couple of metres. Uh, the only difference with West Cork is that we, we actually have you know, much fewer pe pe people to get in the way of the, the views. I don't know if Pauline is here, but you'll remember this incident of the, the northern bottlenose whale that spent five days in Pulleyan Harbour. Absolutely amazing. We spent watching this amazing creature. So the potential for land and boat-based observations here off the south coast is, is absolutely fantastic. So much so that I, decide, I had to make a decision that uh, my travelling days were probably drawn to a little bit of a close, so I, was I needed to get closer to where the activity was. So I, I made, took the plunge and moved uh, to, the, to the real, the people's capital, as they say, and that, that one's been alluded to earlier. Uh, and I spent four years out at the old head of Kinsale, uh, an amazing place, watching systematically, hunting if you like, watching from the cliff tops, watching week after week, month after month, year after year, to pick up these trends so that we could get baseline data on, on, on whales and their movements and their seasonality. Spent four amazing years out here. Uh, every single day just blew me away. There was 
talk about moments of astonishment. Every single day I had half a dozen moments of astonishment whale watching from the headlands and cliff tops of West Cork, Cape Clear Island, the old head of Kinsale, Galley Head. Absolutely amazing. The first time I saw these big, um, big blowers, these fin whales, distant fin whales, as their blows peppered the horizon, I, I knew I was in trouble. I knew I was absolutely hooked. Uh, and that this gut reaction that I had on that pier wall in Greystones as a young 13-year-old uh, just came back to me. And I, people were saying, well, what are you going to do? You know, are you going to get a job in, on Main Street? And I was going, no, this, this is just important work. It needs to be done. This activity just is going unnoticed. It's not being recorded but by, by very many other people in the North Atlantic, let alone uh, on, on a wider spectrum. So I spent four years watching these amazing animals uh, in West Cork. And of course, with that, uh, it built up a certain sort of a critical mass where we started running training courses and programs out in places like Cape Clear Island and workshops. And of course, the reason for that was to build up a body of um, interested people who are interested in biological recording and interested in recording in particular cetaceans, whales and dolphins. Uh, and the best way that we could actually do that was by training people. Again, this whole thing of empowering people, giving people the wherewithal so that they could go out and sit up on a cliff top and whale watch and identify the different species uh, that we could possibly see. Of course, we're rarely alone when we go whale watching now. It's very much become a mainstream activity, whereas 15, 20 years ago, when people like myself and Simon Barrow were coming down to West Cork whale watching, we were kind of like uh, on, the, on the lunatic fringe of the bird watching community, which is kind of very much more acceptable and standard wildlife uh, activity. Uh, but right now, we're very willing to shout it from the life, you know, from the, 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 the rooftops that whale watching in itself is an amazing activity. We, we live in a place where we are so truly fortunate to be able to observe the most amazing creatures on the planet. And flowing then from this whole building up of a strong network of people who are interested in recording whales and dolphins, um, started coming the research uh, which, which was seeded. And one of the research projects where I am personally involved in is photo identification, where we go out on boats and we photograph whales, both Whales that are recognisable, like with humpback whales, we can recognise individual animals and kind of give them personalities. Uh, one of them springs to mind, Boomerang. I bet there's people here who have been out in a boat in West Cork with somebody like Colin Barnes and actually seen Boomerang. He's a humpback whale, we can't get rid of him. You can set your clock in late August on Boomerang returning to the waters within about five or six miles of this very hotel. Absolutely amazing. Um, so we're, we can recognise individual whales that are returning year after year to these very rich, diverse waters in West Cork. We can also recognise new whales that are coming, and what we're doing is we're building up a catalogue, and all of these animals with their identifiable images go up on the website of the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group. So if you guys are out in a boat and you see a whale, you can actually go to our website and see if we can match it. All of these resightings tell us very, very important information. Some of the other research is acoustic research, because of course whales and dolphins, they live in an acoustic world of sound. 95% of the time we can't see them. So the only effective way to study them is by listening to the underwater environment in which they live. Uh, slightly controversial, but we, we don't, uh, you know, you know, shy away from it is the fact that um, we, we are engaging in some invasive research techniques as well. There's very little other way of capturing uh, tissue samples from whales, so we shoot them uh, occasionally under license from National Parks and Wildlife Service. We're just taking very, very small little skin tissue plugs. 99 times out of 100 whale isn't even aware it's been shot. It doesn't even flinch. In fact, if you miss, the whales tend to have a much bigger reaction because they kind of go, oh, what was that? Simon's missed again. He misses most of the time, in fairness. But this genetics information gives us a whole lot of very powerful information, such as you know, where these whales are interacting with the actual food chain. It tells us, hopefully, uh, well, definitely gives us gender, because we've no way of knowing if these individuals are male or female. It'll give us an idea of their stock identity and even which population these whales are coming from. So this is very, very important research that's ongoing in West Cork. And at the moment, it's funded by West Cork Development Partnership. Thank you very much. There's a plug. Oops. Um, 
There's a huge commercial uh, boat, well not a huge, I don't want to exaggerate it, but there is a, not an insignificant commercial kickback to, to the growing interest in whale watching and whale research. Uh, we've uh, local operators like Colin Burns and the Holly Joe. Uh, there's Colin rolling a cigarette nonchalantly in the back of the Holly Joe as two, spur or two, uh, two humpback whales swim by. But this isn't lost on local communities and this is quite important because these whales are here mostly in winter time. Uh, and a good example was the recent hook head animal, this humpback whale, number 11 on our catalogue, who turned up off Hookhead Lighthouse in County Wexford. And the locals in the lighthouse were saying, oh, before this humpback whale arrived, we did 18 cups of tea. And two days after this whale and his breaching, which we'll show you in a moment, appeared on TV, they just had to bring in extra staff. They were doing like 136 lunches at Hookhead Lighthouse. They hadn't a clue what was going on. So the <coughs> potential impact of uh, marine ecotourism to coastal communities at a time when coastal communities are genuinely struggling uh, should not be um, un understated. This is just a, a nice um, example uh, and uh, uh, an individual put this up in, uh, in Clonakilty and it's just, um, I think, uh, represents an increasing likelihood that West Cork and places like West Cork are going to become uh, firmly associated with the amazing whale activity that we have. And in the same way as West Cork is synonymous with, uh, with, with good organic food, West Clare is synonymous with good music uh, and the like. What we want to do is put whales firmly on the map along the entire south coast, but I think West Cork is very well situated to take full advantage of that. Just going to sh show you, rattle off a few images, all taken within literally a stone's throw of uh, Baltimore Beacon, quite honestly. Uh, we're so lucky to have these animals turning up so close to our shore. Generally, we see these animals within a couple of, uh, within a couple of miles of our shore. Absolutely amazing. Galleyhead Lighthouse there with fin whales blowing just very, very close to it. These whales have been absent for so many so many uh, generations. Your fathers, your parents, for those of you from West Cork, did not see these whales. Their fathers did not see them. They were not around. They were gone. Many of these animals, like humpback whales, were on the brink of extinction. And they are coming back. It's a fantastic story. And as cust custodians of our inshore waters, there's a strong onus on us all to make sure that these whales come back year after year so that our children and our children's children can sit out in places like Galleyhead Lighthouse and watch breaching humpback whales.